Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Our final session is about to begin. May I request everyone to settle in, please? Our guest of honor, Minister for National Development and Minister in Charge of Social Services Integration, Desmond Lee, was supposed to join us for the dialogue today. Unfortunately, he is unable to, as he is unwell. We now have Dr. Janil Putucheri, who will join us for the dialogue today. Dr. Janil is Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Communications and Information, and Ministry of Health. He is also chairman of OnePeople.sg and Young PAP. The Q&A session will be moderated by Dr. Kalpana Vignesa, Senior Research Fellow of the Institute of Policy Studies. May I now invite Dr. Janil Puducherry and Dr. Kalpana Vignesa on stage, please. Please have a seat. Good afternoon, one and all. And, you know, sometimes plans go astray. <laughs> and we have SMS with us here, and we are very, very grateful that you've been able to step in at short notice. Um, and you are also a known friend to the youth movement, so I think that works well. Um, audience, if you would like to ask a question, so we have an entire hour to regale SMS with questions. Um, please walk up to the microphone, introduce yourself before ans asking the question. Um, do limit yourself to one question so that we can take as many as possible. You can also scan the QR code at the back of your name tag uh, and post a question on pigeonhole. Before we jump into the Q&A, I wanted to ask everyone a favor. So, we don't often have such a high-profile platform devoted especially to youth issues. So let's search our minds for the most incisive questions that cut to the crux of youth issues and aspirations in Singapore. And I thank you in advance, and I will privilege those types of questions. Additionally, um, you know, it would be great if we could get to the heart of your valuable question quickly. <laughs> I will get the ball rolling, and because I am the moderator, I get the special privilege of asking two questions. <laughs> okay, so, SMS. There's this theme that has um, repeatedly come up in the work I do, uh, that I've heard from young women over the, over the course of the last decade, really, and it has come up a few times today. So when we delved into the data of the Singapore Perspectives pre-conference poll, we see that young women are less interested in getting married and having children than young men. So a widely held interpretation of this is that, you know, we have made incredible strides in terms of gender equality in education and even employment. However, patriarchal norms still dominate the family and the caregiving sphere. More and more women are making valued contributions at work and in the civic sphere, and they are alive to the fact that, you know, marriage and children may significantly disadvantage them. They worry that they are likely to end up primarily responsible for the visible and the invisible labor of running a family. You know, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Shannon earlier, who called it an endless vortex in terms of the needs of a family or of doing your work, you know, giving 100% of your work. But in terms of they, they come back home after a day's work and there's so many things that they're in, women tend to be in charge of, whether it's you know, what their kids are eating, are they running out of underwear, you know, um, what are their extracurricular activities, managing all the babysitters, etc., etc., right? So how do you think we need to respond to the inequities of familial labor? And how should we adapt our notions of what it means to be a man or a woman as caregiving becomes a larger role in our lives? Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, good to be back at IPS uh, answering <laughs> difficult questions. Uh, <laughs> But I think the way that you asked your question, you're expecting only one answer from me, which is the men have to do more. If you feel that way. <laughs> uh, 
and, and I don't disagree. I don't disagree. Yeah. Um, and my sense is that uh, men are doing more. The question is, yeah. is it enough? And what is the direction of travel? And how do you bring the entire society with you? Um, I, I think times have changed. I think times have changed. Certainly, sure. certainly since the time when I first became a father, and I was asked, do you really need to take paternity leave? Uh, by a mother of three, but uh, you know, I won't name the person. Um, but, uh, but times have changed. Yesterday, when I was uh, in my constituency, uh, we were walking around, and we saw plenty of fathers uh, looking after their children, feeding them, while uh, their wives were, were doing the shopping or playing with the older kids. So I think some of those norms have shifted. The question is, should we now do more, impose certain values, uh, tell people this is how you must be a man, this is how you must be a woman, this is how you must be a husband. And I think that's perhaps a step too far. Uh, surely, as part of our development and our progress as a society, we, we have to allow for some people to say, well, this is what I feel are my values as a family, either on the basis of, well, partly religion, maybe your ethnicity, your culture, your history, but also your worldview. And we need to be accepting that there are multiple ways of, of doing this. Um, for some, it's a very practical assessment that they make. Some families, it's about who spends the time at work, who spends the time at home. And there may be an economic basis to that decision. There may be other types of bases, for example, who might care for other members of the family other than the children. So I think my point being, I agree with you. Men have to do more. But I think as a society, we do also need to be a little bit forgiving to allow people to find their way to do this. And my third point would be, I think we have made progress and I think our society is changing already. I, I mean, I fully agree. I think society is changing and, and moving in the, in the right direction, at least the right direction as far as my worldview is concerned. But the question is not, it's not so much just about that. It's also, you know, this, the fact that young women are kind of responding to what they're seeing, the burnout that they see in their mothers and all this, oh, the, the women ahead of them. So it's more about, I guess, yes, there, there's, there's things that we can do and there's things that we can't do, but we also see this happening as a kind of, as a pushback. And, you know. Like, well, I mean, I think if, 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 a, if a young woman says that she wants to concentrate on her career, I mean, I think that that's a valid choice. Uh, likewise, I think if a young woman says, I want to raise a family and I want to take time away from the career, I think we shouldn't penalize her for that Definitely and, not. And, and tell her that's the wrong way to do it. Yep. The ideal would be that do, do it all, do everything, but unfortunately, our biology isn't sort of set up for that. We're now living till our 80s, um, a long career trajectory, but unfortunately, childbearing age hasn't changed. Um, so that is a, a natural challenge that young women have. Um, I think on the, my view on this, I hope, uh, is positive, and I hope we can encourage people to see the positivity in this. I think if you're a 15-year-old girl in Singapore coming, seeing the end of your education in sight, I hope we're a society where every opportunity is put on the table. You can be anything, you can do anything. Um, you have an additional struggle later on in life to make a choice about how you navigate that path. And actually, I think the entire family should help you navigate that path. Uh, so I get back to my original one-liner TLDR version, which I think was the model answer to the question you were lobbing at me. The men need to do more. <laughs> okay. Well, my second question is a completely, completely different tact. Um, so... Throughout the sessions, there has been this sort of uh, theme of how we as a society manage diversity. Um, and when I say diversity, I mean, you know, whether it's uh, how we define family or uh, whether we become more of a plural society, etc., politically plural society. Uh, so that there's so many different types of diversity. And the trade-offs and how that balances with stability. Um, so, do you want to just riff off that for a bit? Riff off that? <laughs> it's not often I'm invited to riff off something, but thank you very much. Uh, but you're really asking how we navigate that increasing diversity or the wish for increasing diversity. I'm sorry, and the last bit with, with stability. Yeah, I guess, you know, status quo, things as they are, 
obviously uh, a lot of people are comfortable yeah. with the way things are as they are. Um, and so it's this push and pull action, right? Yeah. I, I would say firstly, when we talk about diversity in our society, I think there are some um, subtle differences qualitatively which have an outsized impact, uh, which is that we have always wanted to deal with the issues of diversity, whatever the di dimension of diversity that you talk about, and you, you mentioned families, uh, gender, plur pluralism, politics, but deal with them in a way which reduces polarization and fragmentation. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the historical three right, in our pledge, race, language, and religion, uh, you, dealing with each of those three archetypes of social division, those potential sources of fragmentation, diversity, or pluralism, you, you can see historically each has been dealt with differently. But the common thread that runs across all of the, whether it's the policy approach, whether it's our way in which we've engaged in the community, whether it's about a, a, a political approach and governance, is that whatever we have done, we have tried to the, increase the peace. We have tried to make sure that whatever process results in further sense of cohesion, uh, a reduced sense of ideological polarization, and a sense that we have to deal with this together. I, I think that's a useful and underappreciated value. And when, we, when it comes to then new sources of diversity, if you think about it in the positive, or fragmentation, if you're worried about the, the risks, then as long as we approach them in a way where we are trying to increase cohesion, increase uh, a sense of unity, not that we all have to agree, but we all have to agree to keep the peace, we yeah. all have to agree to find a way forward together. Then that, I think, is the foundation for finding the right balance between change, inclusion, diversity, and that sense of stability and comfort with the status quo ante. The, the reality is change is going to happen. Change is going to happen. So how do you then bring together the people who would like things to stay the same with the people who are looking for change? And I think you do have to look for those common threads. Yes. Um, so neither is good by itself. You need some aspects of stability. Everything changes and people are anxious. Um, how will I, sorry, if everything changes, people are anxious. How will I plan my, my career or my, my education in order to, to get a job which may or may not exist by the time I'm in the workforce? How will I plan my family? Yep. Um, and so you need some sense of stability and predictability, but not only, otherwise life gets boring. I just want to just, you, you said something really interesting just now. You talked about these groups coming together. So in the work you do, right, you know what these groups are that might be on opposite sides. of. Can you tell us a little bit about if you're seeing them come together, how they're coming together, are they talking to each other, what's going on? Well, no, I mean, uh, they, well, firstly, behind closed doors, very few people say we're on opposite sides. Mm. You know, behind closed doors, the work that we do at OnePeople.sg, we... We engage with many networks, many community groups, many organizations. You, you have a private, frank conversation, and everybody starts on the basis, we're all Singaporeans here, we want to find the best way forward together. Um, and that's an it's a, it's a important data point, because I think one of the earlier speakers spoke about, for example, the, the structural incentives for ideological polarization that, that occur um, for politicians, potentially to, you know, in a negative way. It's not just politicians. Any number of people in the public space commentators, media content creators, online personalities, there is a structural incentive to take a polarizing view, a divisive view. Um, and the reality is many organizations understand that this is not productive and not useful. And so when you are able to have that dialogue, I do see that people are interested in coming together. And I think what we need to do is make sure we continue to give people good reasons to seek common ground and reduce the reasons to fragment us and find reasons to divide us. All right, so let's see if we've got some questions that we can find some common ground on. <laughs> hi, Dr. Tambaya. Yeah, hi. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Tambaya from the medical school again, and my question again is my own. Uh, thanks, uh, Janil, for <laughs> stepping in at the last minute. Um, just a very uh, simple kind of question. Um, today, you know, we heard a lot about young people but we heard very little about young people with disabilities, uh, in both mental and physical disabilities. Um, and my question is whether you think we could do more in specific areas 
Uh, and I'm going to highlight two areas. The first area is the area of integration. Uh, and I think uh, moving ACS to Tengah and having a special needs school on the same premises is a huge step. Uh, I just wonder whether we could do more in that area. And the second is in the area of protection from discrimination. Uh, and uh, I'm going to cite a very particular example, which is um, certain professions or certain occupations, when you apply for a job, they ask you, do you have a history of uh, psychiatric or, or mental illness? Uh, and very often, young people would refuse to seek medical attention because they don't want to, to be caught filling in that uh, box inaccurately or, or, or not declaring it. So, so they would rather suffer, essentially, the ill effects of the, the mental health situation um, because people, employers and uh, regulatory agencies are allowed to ask that kind of question. So just be interested in your thoughts on those two areas. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, you know, we, we have to stop meeting like this. <laughs> I think you had the first question for me at the other two times I appeared at IPS as well. <laughs> People will think it's a setup. Uh, and, and, uh, and like Kalpana, I think you have handed me a question where the model answer is yes and yes. Thank you, next. Um, no, <laughs> but let me flesh out a little bit. Um, I, I, I do think that we should work better on integrating all people with challenges. I mean, whatever those challenges may be, you don't have to be young to have a challenge with your disability or your mental health. It's a particular issue if you're starting out your career and you can't get into that first job, you can't get into that first development track. Um, and so they spend a lot of time thinking and worrying about this. And I agree, we do have to do more. Uh, the the co-location of facilities is, uh, it's useful, it's important, but I think we shouldn't take the view, box ticked, job done. Uh, the students leave school and then they have to face the rest of the world where you don't have the ability to then structurally engineer all the facilities exactly as you would like it as you could within a formal education space. Uh, so the work of integrating um, everyone into these opportunities, thinking about job redesign, process redesign, uh, how you s uh, upskill HR personnel, how you handle performance-related issues. I think it's ongoing work. I know many of my colleagues are spending a lot of time thinking about this um, and uh, putting an effort to do so. Uh, and I agree, we should continue to do more and do better. And th this work is never going to be done and never going to be completed. The issue of the discrimination from uh, jobs at the point of application is important, is important. Um, and uh, I think we do need to look at this and make sure that when the questions are asked at the point that you apply for a job, they are relevant and salient for the job. Uh, and you know, today we, we, we generally hold the view that whatever your race and whatever your religion, this is not going to affect your ability to do a job. But that wasn't always true in history. Uh, and we've come a long way. Thank goodness for that, and let us continue. Uh, we need to make the point that issues like mental health or a history of mental health illness uh, is not relevant for every job. But it would be hard for me to say it will never be relevant for every job. And, and I give you the example of medical school, which Professor Tambaya will be very familiar with. Uh, when I applied to medical school many years ago, as you can tell from my hair loss, uh, I was asked about the illnesses that I had suffered, including the viral illnesses that I may or may not have had. And I had to prove that I was immune to certain diseases. Uh, and I knew at the point that I had a blood test that if I was positive for certain viruses, I would never be allowed to go to medical school. Uh, and the same was true when I applied for a residency post and a specialist post. And we take the view that that's necessary to, so that we protect the patient. Uh, on the advice of infectious diseases specialists like Dr. Tambaya. <laughs> not that I, it's not your fault, I'm not saying this. Um, but you don't take an absolutist position. And within the medical specialty, if you've joined, you join medical school and later on you suffer an illness, generally speaking, we find some other part of the discipline where you can continue to play a useful role without necessarily uh, exposing yourself or the patient to risk. So I think over time, that type of approach, of approach towards mental illness is necessary. Um, as it happens, I chair the Interagency Task Force on uh, 
mental health and wellness. Um, th this wasn't a planted question. You know, you and those of you that know me and Paul, you'll know this is not a planted question. Uh, I chair the Interagency Task Force on Mental Health, and this is one of the issues that we are studying very closely, how we can help to deal with the problems around mental health, not just discrimination, but integration at the workplace. We're having a debate in Parliament uh, on the uh, 5th, 6th, and 7th of February, and this will be spoken about at great length and in great detail um, because it's something that we are working on. But the laws and regulations are one thing. What we really need is a shift in attitudes that just as we today recognize that persons with physical disabilities bring to bear many different skills and viewpoints useful to us as a society, and we have to find a way to be proactively inclusive we should have the same attitude towards people with mental health illnesses as well. Thank you, SMS. Now, I um, saw someone else standing over there as well. Do we? Hi. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Clement Tan, and I'm from Ping Dot. Uh, I just want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here today. I also do want to say uh, very quickly before I, j I jump to my question, how uh, hard sorry, Cle sorry, Clement. We can't hear you very well. Do you want? It's not very clear. Okay, <laughs> let me start again. Hi, yeah. my name is Clement, and I'm from Ping Dot. Uh, I just want to start off by saying how heartened I am by the number of young people who are here in attendance, speaking so vocally about the issues that matter to them, claiming space and asking questions about LGBTQ inclusion are often unprompted. Uh, I don't think I had that bravery when I was at that age, so I'm very humbled. Um, to me, in the work that I've done in Ping Dot, I'm not surprised that LGBTQ inclusion as a topic is on the forefront of young people. In the work that we've done, we've seen that the young have a stronger belief in LGBTQ acceptance. Around 70% of the people who attended our event last year are below the age of 30. Uh, we know that more and more LGBTQ youth are coming out, um, and they are coming out at younger and younger ages. They are also becoming more articulate about the issues that matter to them, when we polled them last year post-repeal, um, we know that on top of bullying and harassment in schools, they also care a lot about barriers to home ownership and barriers to family formation. Now, in the work that I've done with the youth over the past 10 years, um, what I've seen is that LGBTQ youth do not believe that there is a future for them here in Singapore because of the barriers of inclusion. And to me, there's a bit of deja vu. When I came out to my parents 12 years ago, my mother pulled me aside and she counseled me to say that I needed to migrate out of Singapore to have a future that was full of happiness. She said that I should break my bond, stay overseas, and then I could settle down and raise kids if I wanted to because that's not a possibility here in Singapore. Now, 12 years on, I guess I'm facing that same conversations with youth of today. So my question to you is, what is your message to LGBTQ youths? You are a father and you work with young people all the time. Can you tell them, will it get better? And what is your hope for the, what hope should they have for the future? Uh, what can they hold on to? Thank you. Thank you, Clement. Excellent question. Um, my message is stay, fight, stand up for what you believe in, in a way that brings in inclusion and brings every, Singaporean with you on that journey and make our society better from your point of view. The problem we have is that not all of us agree on what better is, but we do need to have the discussions around that. We do need to have the discourse and that engagement about how we go forward. If you leave, you take your ideas and your views with you, and that's not going to help your cause. When your mom took you aside and, and, and told you that, Neither you nor her nor me or many other people would imagine that last year we would have repealed 377A. Our society changes just as our aspirations change, our view on how we might deal with people in society who have a different view from us also changes. And if you want to make a difference, leaving isn't going to help. Um, I've had the privilege of studying and working overseas, uh, and some of that has been in with youth who have had challenges, and some of those challenges in adolescence have been with LGBTQ-related issues. Uh, and we shouldn't have a rose-tinted view that in societies where perhaps the social mores are different, or the legal structures are different, or the espoused 
centrist standard view is different, that young people are not facing challenges or being discriminated against. They are. It, grass isn't always automatically greener on the other side. But, but that's not my central point. My central point is you're Singaporean, you care about Singapore, you want Singapore to be inclusive in a certain way. Not everybody will agree with you, but you're not going to engage with the matter and make things better from your point of view unless you stay, stand up, and speak up, which you and your colleagues have done uh, successfully. Thank you, Clement. Yes, there's a question over there. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Butcher and Dr. Kapana. My name is Wayne, and I'm a J2 student from Raffles Institution. So I apologize for the slightly long preamble. But my question is regards to the roles that youth play in cultivating an inclusive society and filling the gaps in today's society, especially in Singapore. Now, the government's approach when crafting policies is to benefit as many people as possible. And I think I agree with that. That's the most rational approach and the most uh, productively efficient one. But with this, inadvertently, there are people that always fall through the cracks. Taking care of the 99% means slowly letting go of the 1%, which in the case of Singapore would mean that we are most of the time not looking at 55,000 people. So undoubtedly in this case, the government's reach is limited, right? They cannot tend to everybody's needs. So my question would be, how can you position ourselves in a way to better recognize these people who slip through the cracks? And what can we do in our own capacity to help them? Sorry, I didn't catch the gentleman's name. Can you state your name again, please? Uh, I'm Wayne. Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I disagree that looking after the 99% means letting go of the 1%. Why should it be so? Why do we have to say that you have to let go of the 1% in order to look after 99%? We, we want our cake and eat it. We want to look after everybody. We want to make sure that opportunities are available to all. Easier said than done. Um, and you know there are plenty of people working very hard to try and deliver on this. Uh, but I think we have to start on that basis, that we do have to bring everybody along. And if you are going to apply state resources to uplift families, to up, especially the next generation, then perhaps it is the most vulnerable and the most challenged that need the most help. And that's how we have structured our policies and our approaches. So we don't say, well, let's just look after the broad middle and everybody else fend for themselves. Uh, and in fact, most of our assistance schemes are tilted in such a way that the, the people who are in so difficult circumstances, vulnerable families, had a challenging lot in life as their starting position, they get more assistance, whether it's about direct cash assistance, access to educational programs, access to processes to uplift their families. That's our approach. And by extension, then, if you are relatively well-to-do, you, you've had a stable life, you've had lots of opportunities and done well for yourself, you perhaps have the space, freedom, and opportunity to look after yourself better. And then the state and our government programs can take a step back. And I think if we can calibrate that correctly, that balance of creating opportunities for all, not by distributing everything absolutely equally, but tilting the balance so that we distribute the help and the assistance to the people who need it most, then potentially we can achieve that thing that I talked about right at the beginning, which is not talk about letting people go or, or focusing only on one group at the expense of the other, but correctly addressing the needs of every Singaporean. It's not easy to do. It, it, it's easy to say, but not easy to do. It requires ongoing work, and it requires a certain view from society. It has, it, it has to be so. I mean, the government can set the, the tone, we can set the policy like this, but if politically people don't engage with this and say, actually, I do want you to look after me at the expense of somebody else, we then have a problem in carrying out that type of mandate or that type of policy and political approach. But historically, as a people, that is not the view that we have taken. The view that Singaporeans have taken is indeed no man left behind. You, you apply your resources maximally to those who need it most, and by extension then, those who don't need quite so much need to contribute and play their part in helping uplift our entire society. So not that I like to disagree, but I, I, I do disagree with that idea of 
letting the 1% go. I, I, I think we shouldn't try to even countenance that. Well, there's kind of a related question that's come up online about you know, whether meritocracy in its current form encourages and propagates generational inequality. So families of high socioeconomic standing can fund development of their children, feeding them to the top. What are your thoughts on meritocracy to ensure fairness in this day and age? It's a good question, but I think there's a conflation between the two. Even in the absence of a good meritocratic system, you will always have the risk of intergenerational transfers of wealth and uh, the ability for families then to look after their children disproportionately. It's a very natural human tendency. Uh, so yes, there may well be generational inequality, uh, but I think to lay the blame entirely at the ideal of meritocracy is perhaps a step too far. How you operate a meritocracy is important, regardless of whether or not there's generational, intergenerational inequality. I mean, even if we solve one problem, you still have to make sure that your meritocracy is fair and that when we talk about merit and reward, when we talk about opportunity, uh, it is the correct thing that we are recognizing. The, so I think, firstly, I would say meritocracy is not ideal, but like democracy, it's the least worst system. Uh, and you let it run on its own, you set all the SOPs in place, and you take your eye off the ball, it can go wrong. And so our meritocracy is something that needs to be nurtured and grown tended to carefully adjustments made along the way, which I hope we will continue doing, whether it's about our policies in education, our policies on welfare, our policies on economic redistribution or economic growth. Each of these things will have a bearing on how well matched our meritocracy is to the needs of Singapore and Singaporeans today and tomorrow. Intergenerational inequality, I think, is adjacent but separate. I'm, you do want to make sure that that you deal with the opportunities provided to each generation of children, regardless of their starting point in life. But to absolutely ensure that there is no difference between every child, it's an unworkable system. I mean, and it's, the experiment has been tried. It, it, so what we need is our programs and approaches to then address how do we help those who don't have the benefit of intergenerational transfers, yeah. whether of knowledge or wealth or opportunity. And if you look at what we are doing in the preschool space, the uplift programs, the, ex the, the investments that we're making for early childhood, the um, attempts that we are making in terms of detecting and engaging families who are in this situation, that is exactly our philosophy. How do we apply our, the skill and expertise of educators, social workers, care workers, and the institutions they represent to the families who don't have every advantage in life starting off. I think, you know, on this point, it came up earlier today talking about uh, preschool. Part of the problem as well is just who we are culturally and how we look at the landscape and think about, you know, we want the best for our children and what that looks like. And so, you know, despite uh, what's been happening in the preschool space, right, in the last decade, now there's this feeling of, but there's so much more, and do I need to be paying $4,000 a month for my, for my child? And is that what's going to make me a good parent, you know? Um, so I think that's also part of the story, like how we assess the options available. I saw, yes, there's a question up there. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Yi Heng. I'm a J2 student from Daman High School. Um, so... Uh, my question is a little more personal for uh, Dr. Puttacheri. So actually my question is inspired by um, our discussion today on uh, the pl plurality and diversity of viewpoints in parliament and politics in Singapore. And so my question to Dr. Puttacheri is, uh, how do you find your role as the party whip for the People's Actions Party? And what value do you find in this, uh, in this role with regards to Singapore's uh, larger political system? Thank you. I, I, I don't know, does IPS lose all its funding if I answer a political question? <laughs> right. um, well, uh, uh, thank you, Yi Heng, for your question. Uh, the, the, the role of party whip is an interesting one, uh, most of which I'm not really supposed to talk about. <laughs> Just tell us a little bit. Uh. 
<laughs> um, yeah, well, the website says that I'm in charge of party discipline. <laughs> and what does that mean? <laughs> and organizing the government's business in parliament. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about uh, the, the really boring stuff, which involves the spreadsheets and who's speaking for how many minutes of the parliamentary debate and in what order and so forth. Um, the, um, the one uh, first thing I should get actually fairly early on is that if you, if you, if you think that the, my role as party whip, uh, if you base your views having watched House of Cards, please, it's nothing like that, okay? <laughs> Just know. Um, it's like learning medicine from Grey's Anatomy. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, well, you, you have a role of party whip because to be in a political party needs to mean something. Yeah. It cannot be a vehicle of convenience, it cannot be a, a badge of convenience, it cannot be a merely an administrative function. Uh, and so parties have positions that they take, they have values that they espouse, they stand for something. Now, at the same time, within that, the party as a broad church, as, a, as an organization that brings together diverse views and provides a platform for settling that divergence of views. You've you got to have your MPs, your stakeholders, your party activists, your carders. People have different views about any, any issue that you can think of in Singapore. But you can't, as a party, stand up and say, I have no view. My members have many different views. I have no view. That, that's not a, a tenable position with which to uh, give an accounting of yourself to the people of Singapore. And so you need a process where you allow for engagement, diversity, discussion, but then ultimately you need to come together. And once you agree to come together, what you don't want is then having everybody agreed, consensus is built, this is the line that we're gonna take, you step outside, well, you were at the committee, you've agreed, now you step outside, Please, you've got to play on the same side. You are a, a member of this party. You stand for our values, and you uphold a certain standard. So part of my role is making sure that tension between an, a platform for debate, discourse, development of new ideas, driving the, the agenda forward, and a sense of cohesion in order to get something done. Because absent that last bit, you spend all your time bickering internally about uh, whose views matter and whose views don't matter, and then you cannot come together and implement and execute and improve people's lives. So that's one of the reasons why it's not just party discipline put on the website, but you need a process. Now, the thing that I don't do is literally walk around with a whip and crack it. <laughs> Let's be very clear. Um, I, have to, uh, I have to engage with our... Uh, members, our members of parliament, our party membership. Um, I have to help them do what I've just described. I have to help them understand that need for shift towards consensus, that need for shift towards implementation and execution. At the same time, I have to protect their space to have those views aired. And that is a trade-off between the two. I, I, no, we're not gonna get anything done if I tell them you can't say anything in parliament or I provide them with a script. I have to provide them the space and time to be able to air that diversity of views, have that debate and that discourse. Um, so it works in both directions. But uh, the TLDR version is don't believe house of cards, okay? That's not, that's not how it works. My, my tool, my implement is not a whip, it's a, a WhatsApp message. Um, uh, some of my parliamentary colleagues are, are in the house today uh, and the audience, and they know that I have now become that person where everybody dreads a WhatsApp message from. You know, uh, because it usually means either I have, a, I have some uh, difficult thing that I need to counsel them on, counsel them on, uh, or I've been asked to give them more work. So uh, they, they try very hard not to, to uh, look at my WhatsApp messages. I think, um, you know, the audience wants to probe a little bit more on pers your personal thoughts. There's a, the next top voted question is, what is one area of concern that keeps you awake at night which you feel we should focus on? Oh, only one. I, I'm <laughs> Top. <laughs> Prioritize. <laughs> well, I'm going to riff on the comment made by the panel about this issue of polarization and fragmentation because it can affect us in so many ways. And I am concerned that there are any number of 
structural incentives, if you like, uh, especially in this day and age of uh, social media, of tech accelerated comms, um, of lots of money to be made in advertising, lots of money to be made in, in, in content creation and audience uh, growth, that there are incentives to drive polarization. And I think that is not an approach that we have historically found beneficial to us as a country at all. Um, and the, the difficulty is that in politics, a vote is binary. You are either voting for the party or you're not. Well, you're not necessarily binary, I mean, multiple choices. But you, at each choice, it's binary. Uh, and you could see that as potentially polarizing. In some societies, your political choice comes along with ideological polarization. In other words, you vote for this party, that means you stand for these types of values in direct opposition for, for, from someone who stands for another political party and another set of values. What we have so far been able to do is separate out largely in our public space the, the, the act of voting, which is potentially polarizing, you, you vote for one party, you vote for another party, from an ideological polarization. We are still a society where, regardless of whatever party you voted for, I voted for, um, I, I hope you know which party I voted for, I hope that's not <laughs> doubt. But whatever party you voted for, I voted for, we still find common ground. And actually, we have every reason to see ourselves as one people, I'm not selling Koyo for one people.sg, but as one people. But there are societies in this world where the opposite has happened and where political affiliation has come along with ideological polarization to the point where you cannot engage at all on a social basis, uh, where you have dating sites set up on the basis of which part of the political spectrum you support. I suggest that's not a business model for Singapore, I hope. Um, and I think that, that is an important issue. If we are going to have political contestation, and we are, if we are going to have Westminster-style parliament and democracy, and we do, you have to make a choice at the ballot box. But at the same time, the way in which we have developed over the last 58 years is to not have ideological social polarization. And the point made that the main political parties all compete for that centrist view. It's a good thing. And I think we need to find ways to hang on to that idea that we need that sense of coming together and we should not have ideological social polarization. So that keeps me up at night. On that note, right, we are trying to you know, guard against ideological social polarization. We're lucky that we don't really have an extreme version of that. In fact, I have a vivid memory of a photograph from the last election where a couple, one dressed in blue, one dressed in white, you know, going to vote together. Um, Do they have babies? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't know. But um, the thing is that, you know, so the fact that we have that and we should celebrate that suggests that we have some political maturity, right? But um, it's often, often said that we don't, uh, especially in relation to young people. Youth don't have... Oh, I never said that. I didn't say that. Oh, okay, said. thank you. I said it's often said. Um, you know, the, the political maturity in youth needs to be developed. This is why we can't lower the voting age. They're not ready. This kind of commentary, everyone has heard it, right? So there are two questions um, that have come in online that are related to this. So I'm just going to read the questions to you and then you can riff off them. Uh, how can we develop a politically mature and politically conscious society? Is this something we should strive towards and expect of our citizenry? How do we encourage critical thought in our education? The second one is, if a formal political education curriculum has too many risks, how then... Too many risks. Risks, yeah. How then can youths educate themselves about politics without being radicalized? And what would be the most pertinent topics and concepts? Yeah, good, good. thank you. Um, well, who says we're not politically mature? I mean, I, I, young people in Singapore have views. 
they, they turn up, they ask questions, searching, probing questions at the microphone today. I, when, I, when I work in the community uh, or grassroots events, they turn up, they, they've read the website, they've <laughs> understood the issues, they ask questions. So what is the marker of maturity that you're looking for? Um, not you personally, I didn't say you said it. Um, but you know, it, it, it's like, does activism only require you to, to, to strike and to rally or, you know, what, what, is the, what does it mean to be politically mature? And, and I would argue, I would argue that we undersell ourselves. I agree. We undersell ourselves. <laughs> We, we have people who understand the issues. The fact that, that you sit in the kopitiam and, or you take a taxi and the uncle is berating me, thank you uncle, whichever uncle you are, he's informed. He knows what's happening in the world. Uh, and he knows what's happening not just in our polity but in, in the neighborhood as well. Now, w w would I like him to be better informed about my politics and policies? Of course, yes. Um, but he's not disinterested. And I think the same is true for our young people. They are interested, they're engaged. It will always be necessary to do more political education. But I think we shouldn't start on the basis of we are not a politically mature society. I think it, how can we improve? That's always necessary. Um, because you should never say that we've arrived. Uh, but I don't necessarily agree that we should rate ourselves as much worse than any society out there. If we, t if we start on that basis, then how do we make sure that each generation continues to be politically engaged? Um, well, I, I think there is no one answer to this. I know that within the formal education space, uh, increasing time and uh, platforms have been given to white space for social studies, for example. Um, that uh, the teachers have been given guiding frameworks and then are allowed to work with the children, the students, I should say, young adults, to then establish what are the topics of interest, what is the source material that we would like to engage on. Uh, so some of those things have shifted in our, in our formal education curriculum. They, they, so now they show YouTube videos and so forth and engage on the issues of the day. Uh, I think that your political education cannot stop at the end of your formal education because society develops and you then, going out into the world, need to be interested in the news, interested in what's happening, and get involved in organizations. And there are any number of organizations that participate in this. We heard from Pink Dot and various others, uh, OnePeople.sg, part of our role is to connect up the youth wings of organizations that are interested in issues to do with race and social harmony. Um, and I find lots of young people are getting engaged or starting their own organizations. Yeah. And I think, I think yeah. that process is what I will drive an engaged next generation uh, in our political process. Yeah, I, I mean, we had, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Mustafa who said earlier today as well that you, know, you can't, you're not all going to be engaged in the same things and agree on things. It doesn't matter. Go and engage with what it is that you're interested in, what, you know, is, is, sure. is your space. Um, ah, yes, there's a question over there. Hi, my name is Therese Steele and I'm from Singapore Youth for Climate Action. So my question is uh, now on environmentalism. Um, environmental activism in Singapore in general has accelerated and evolved in the past few years and we've seen like a lot of diversity in the different issues that they now cover. But there's also some criticism of environmental groups as being a Oh, as, as, as they keep on criticizing certain policies, but they don't have solutions. But at the same time, there's, uh, on the other hand, there's other groups that say that, no, but that's not the role of civil society. The role of civil society is to shed light on the issues within those policies themselves, and the technical expertise for solutions is in other people. So I wanted to ask you, what kind of role does civil society play? Is it more of a solution provider, or is it, should it be more of a problem highlighter? And what is the most effective approach for civil society to engage with within Singapore's unique political system? Thank you. Thank you, Therese. Thank you, Clarice. Good question. And well, um, you, you can do both. And I think you need to find the right ways of doing both. Uh, we've, I've been privileged to be uh, one of my, other than party whip, one of my positions is chairman of our youth wing. And one of the things that we have over the last uh, few years been working on uh, is climate change, um, including writing some position papers, where we had quite extensive uh, engagement with uh, SYCA and other 
youth groups, uh, young people who are interested in this. And I, I think you have to have space for both. I think to say that uh, 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 the only thing you need to do is point out the problem, uh, well, it's not that it's unhelpful, but there are people who have a role that can be extended past that and think through the implementation of solutions. So I think there is more than enough need and space for different types of voluntary organizations and civil society organizations. Um, the difficulty arises when people take a view that my, my role is only X and therefore take that to extreme. Uh, because then what you're doing is you're setting yourself apart from the discourse and the, the ability to come together. I think to start off and say, I have a view about the problem is useful. Be at the table, be part of the discussion. But when other people give, them, give their views as well, I, I think there is greatest benefit to, the, to everyone if everybody then says, well, how does that affect my view? And am I perhaps engaging in some form of compromise? And do I have a view on how the technical solution may occur? Uh, I, I would, so I'm trying to, you know, uh, again, have my cake and eat it, suggesting that we can do both. And there is room for youth organizations who can do both. And please come to our next meeting with SYCA. There's a question over there. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel from Cultivate Singapore. Uh, so I'm very glad to hear that there's a lot of interest in finding what we call common ground and common good. Yeah, so right here is something that I, I have a thought about, which is that there are many narratives and ideas out there that are very interesting to people, but not every idea is actually um, of, uh, or rather of uh, the, the best interest of people. Yeah, so we are seeing this uh, playing out in terms of very radical narratives uh, adopted by people and you see the damages that it has done to societies. So one of the ways to find common ground is actually to be able to have common knowledge or perhaps common sources of information. Yeah, so I'm wondering if there is room uh, to not just encourage young people to be uh, participating in uh, political dialogues or in social discussions, but also more room for the government perhaps to release more information and data so that more meaningful discussions, more meaningful analysis can be done even at the younger ages so that we can also then participate uh, better without um, being sucked into very popular uh, narratives which may not actually be of our interest. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Daniel. Um, we have been engaged on a progressive program of making data more easily accessible. Um, so we had the data.gov.sg uh, platform, and we've built on that to see how we can increase the amount of uh, data sharing that's a, that from the public sector uh, out to the public. The, the difficulty actually is that data analysis sounds easy, but is actually not so easy to do. Um, and very often, especially with technical data, scientific data, context matters. Uh, an understanding of the scientific process through which uh, that has been derived matters. Um, so the short answer is I agree with you. Uh, we are trying to find ways to put more data out there, but I'm not entirely sure that will solve the problem of misinformation and misunderstanding. Just putting out more and more raw data, I think it's not going to easily solve the issue of misinformation and misunderstanding. It creates room for people to cherry pick the data, to, to perhaps manipulate it in ways that uh, have a confirmation of their worldview rather than opening their minds to other people's uh, ideas. Uh, so how we curate and uh, handle that process, I think we need to pay some attention to. Um, and the role of educators for young children in schools, the, the media for the rest of us are in, in terms of the public discourse, a academics in terms of taking that research agenda forward, I think will continue to be important front and center. I think we are perhaps some way away from the very sort of utopian ideal of just let all the information out there and everybody will, will work out Freedom of information. what they need to do. Yeah. So there's a question now about mental health. Um, we actually had, uh, in our, the online day of our conference, um, we had a session on um, mental health and well-being. Um, and it was very well attended, and this is an important issue for young people. A lot of data shows us that, right? So the question is, um, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Basically, how should government 
regulate the mental health sector? Do you think there's a need? How does the government regulate that? The mental health sector. So, you know, there's a... I think the question asker is... is um, has, has an assumption that, you know, it's not, not sufficiently regulated. So, what are your thoughts on this? Do you feel like any further regulation could actually help people uh, seek and get the right kinds of mental health care? Thank you. Excellent question. Um, it's something that we've been looking at very closely as part of this uh, interagency task force uh, on mental health. We launched our strategy uh, last November. And quite a lot of what we are proposing and now already starting to implement, uh, other, there, there are components of the strategy where we have an increase in capacity. There are components of the strategy where we are improving capability. And there are components of the strategy where we want to perhaps shift the focus of the discussion. Uh, where do we provide services? How do we provide services? How do we engage the population? Especially when you talk about mass mental health, mental health for everybody, not just um, for a small number. And in that discussion, there is uh, quite a lot of consideration, and we have spent some time thinking about how to regulate. If you talk about the uh, professional clinical services, um, you, you would argue that actually this is already quite well regulated in the hospitals and the polyclinics and the GPs. Um, the social sector has its own set of regulations. Uh, now, the, the need for further regulation will come if there are people who are not currently trained, certified, or regulated who are providing mental health care services. Um, and as we do more uh, of mental health service provisions in the community, it may well be so that there are more types of skill sets and professionals who get involved, and we may need to think about how we make sure that uh, the public, the patient, the client, the person who's seeking help is protected through an appropriate set of regulations. Um, we're studying the matter. I don't think it's something that we, are, uh, we, have, we have settled on exactly who and how, uh, but it is something that we are thinking about. Uh, I, I think the, the first step at dealing with some of these issues actually is capacity and capability development. I think if we have the, in, it's the, cap the capacity improved, the capability development there, and there are better mental health services, better accessibility to mental health services, this is a very natural question that will arise. How do we then make sure that there is adequate protection for the public? Yeah. But I think if we start on the basis of let's just regulate first, before we've done the capacity development and the capability development, perhaps we won't solve the bigger problems around mental health, which are about the quality, accessibility, and, look, and, and how care is delivered and integrated over time. No, it's good to hear because we can tie this up to some of the conversations that we've had today as well as on the online day where, you know, uh, practitioners are pushing us to think more about communities of care and, and how communities can care for each other. And obviously, communities are all not going to be trained in mental health. But yes, that's something that... We're, we're taking it very seriously. I mean, the, the interagency task force brought together many different ministries, many different agencies, people from civil society, from the community, uh, professionals, uh, people who are dealing with education, uh, the, edu the education space, as well as the education and training of the professionals in the space. Uh, and so we really have brought a, a, a very holistic approach to it. I think our strategy that we launched in November demonstrates that, that sense of... Um, uh, a, a holistic approach, but also that sense of let's get down to every last facet of this. Don't, don't just only concentrate on one bit. Let's think through the entire space and see where it is that we can make the biggest possible difference. And I hope that uh, when, we, when we debate this in a few week, couple of weeks, uh, one week time, that we'll put a lot more details and flesh on, on some of the things that we're doing. Great. So we've only got about two minutes left, so there's time for one last short brief question. Hello, I'm Ariel from YIJC, and there have been engagement sessions for young youths to learn about policy making, and it's undeniable that they have become more educated. Is it possible to give young youths, such as students, an important space to speak in, such as at Parliament? How much power do you think the youth can be given? Thank you. The short answer is yes. Um, you know, we have our forward SG sessions, we engage with young people, we have things that are running on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, again, one people at SG, we do a model United Nations uh, uh, conference, we have Harmony Works, but many other organizations create 
spaces and platforms for young people to turn up, to ask questions, and also to speak their mind. How much, uh, how much power do you have? Uh, well, people turn up and listen to you. You know, the, uh, the, the, the leadership, the academic leadership, the political leadership, the civil service leadership, they turn up and they listen to you. They listen to you not just because you're on stage, but also because of the engagements that you have, the, the focused type of discussions when you bring communities of young people together. We listen to you because we do need to understand what are the issues that young people are concerned about, how will they uh, take the agenda forward, what will they do as they participate in the building of the Singapore of the future. So the short answer is you have uh, a significant amount of power or weight. People turn up, people listen to you. Please take advantage of these. The government party whip turns up to listen to you. you know? um, and, and, On short notice. Yeah. And I can't send you a WhatsApp to say change your script or change your question or change your whatever. You know, I, so we turn up, we listen. Um, we find great value at doing so. Uh, and so my return point is please take advantage of these many platforms that are out there uh, and, and, and have your views heard. But you also don't have to wait for these types of formal platforms. Uh, one of the, the things that I in, do in my, in, uh, I enjoy in, in the, my constituency work, um, I, I receive emails. I mean, I receive, my colleagues here will receive plenty of emails as well. I receive WhatsApp messages. So my WhatsApp number is on every lift lobby in the constituency and people message me. Young people message me and they say, these are my views. Uh, and I'm very heartened by that because there is a direct access. People can provide those views and we're dealing with municipal issues, we're dealing with the, the challenges of the town and so forth, political views, but young people do step up to say, these are the things that I worry about, these are the things that I think matter for the future of Singapore, and here is what I think you should do about it. So uh, you have that ability to do so. You can message or email I'm sorry, it sounds very old school, right? I mean, you know, okay, you can DM me as well. Uh, but, 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 you know, WhatsApp, email. Uh, uh, go with the channels that the, the middle-aged person is familiar I think, with. Yeah? I think the main, the, the main takeaway is that, you know, we, there's so many avenues and opportunities. Take advantage of it. Take advantage, to... get your voice heard, and we are listening. Excellent. And on that note, so time is up. And I'm sure, th uh, I'm, I thank you all for asking much better questions, non-model answer questions that I started out with. Uh, and we've had a great discussion. I have enjoyed myself. Thank, thank you very you much, so Dr. Much SMS. Um, and our director is coming to give we stay. Oh, I stay. <laughs> um, please thank SMS. I should let, tell you that he had precisely two hour notice. Um, we confirmed that he had to come down at 2 p.m., had to. In this case, I was the one who was wielding the whip. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he had to cancel a few things, and he appeared. And uh, that's the definition of grace under pressure. So please join me in thanking him. <laughs> uh, it has been a very unusually productive uh, 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 conference. Um, it's too numerous, the suggestions and the points that have been made. I won't attempt to summarize it. I will just take about two minutes to highlight some of the things uh, that struck me. Um, to begin with, uh, actually, a suggestion from the floor, Corina Lim, um, of AWARE, who got up in the first session on work and the youth and pointed out that um, what young people are looking for most in work is meaning and suggested that we think of ways and means of providing that meaning in whatever work they do. I think this is something that is worth thinking about. Um, the session on the family, I think there were a number of mute, uh, very useful suggestions that came up that all bear consideration and further thought. I might just mention David uh, Chung's point that it is not so much a question of cost, but rather how do you reduce uh, what he called relative scarcity or the sense of relative scarcity. Again, this is something that I think we need to consider um, and need to think about further. Um, both uh, Shannon Ang and um, uh, Mohan spoke about how the nuclear family might be expanded 
um, not necessarily by combining people who are related to each other, uh, but through other means, uh, non-relatives. And uh, Mohan spoke, uh, too, about a community of care um, um, encompassing more than just the family. Um, I think the suggestion, the discussion and the politics and youth, um, we centered on one issue, which I'm glad we did uh, over and over again, and that is the trade-off, if you like, or is there a trade-off between pluralism, diversity, and stability? It's perhaps a very peculiarly Singaporean question uh, to worry about such things, and I'm glad that we are worried about such things. Um, I think um, Dr. Mustafa pointed out um, pluralism is here to stay. Um, we have always been a plural society, race, language, religion, as uh, SMS pointed out, and we are bound to be, become um, more plural politically. So the question then is how do you deal with that pluralism? How do you um, uh, uh, become more plural without society tipping over into what um, Dr. Mustafa and others call polarization. And um, I hope Dr. Mustafa is correct um, that whoever his sense, whoever pushes or acts in a way as to incline society to polarize, polarizing acts is not likely to win the support of what he calls middle Singaporeans. And I think um, uh, Dr. Janil um, repeatedly spoke about how at least one tradition in our politics has been to bring people together and keep this place together. So on that note, please thank Dr. Janil um, and all of you um, for a very ex interesting and exciting conference. It remains for me to thank our sponsors, Nian Kongsi and the rest, and the people who organized this conference, Kalpana and Chinyi and uh, the rest, Shannon, for emceeing the place, emceeing the whole conference, as well as the incredible staff that IPS has that put together all this. Thank you all, and see you all next year.